Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to CS 125. <laughs> Welcome to the University of Illinois. Congratulations. How many people here are freshmen? Ah. Welcome to your first college class. They're not all going to be like this. Most of them won't be this awesome. Um, so behind me on stage, my name is Jeff Chan and I teach this class. Behind me on stage are some of the people that are going to help me teach this class this semester. As you can see, this is a big course, and I am lucky to have an enormous amount of help. So behind me on stage, I have a mixture of some of the graduate teaching assistants for the class. Will the teaching assistants raise their hands? All right. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. They're going to be leading your lab sections. I also have uh, course developers that work with me on projects to improve this class. You may not see them in labs or in office hours, but they're going to be working behind the scenes on things that will make this class better. So course developers, raise your hands. Awesome. <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, is the group that you will come to know, you will come to love, you will come to rely on. These are the course assistants for CS125. This class is lucky to have a large and committed group of course assistants. They are here because they love computer science and they are here because they want you to share that love. I actually have 82 of them signed up this semester already. Some of them are here. Those that are here, raise their hand. All right, let's give them a round of applause. So what you see behind me on stage is only about actually one third of the course staff for this class. So there's a lot of you out there in the audience and there's a lot of us here to help you. So let's give the students here a big round of applause. Welcome to Illinois, course staff. I'm gonna let them take off. Some of them have stickers that you may want to pick up as they leave. So why don't you guys make your exit, thank you. Can you guys hear me up in the balcony? Thumbs up. All the way in the back, okay, great. So again, welcome to CS125. I am incredibly excited to be here with you this semester. This is the first time that we've done this class this way. Don't worry, we're gonna have people come up to the balcony if you're sitting up in the balcony. Um, we have an enormous number of people here to study computer science, and I am super excited to be teaching you all uh, this this semester. If you have your laptop with you, please get it out. Go to the course website, pick up the slides, and follow along. This is what we're going to do on a daily basis. This is how you get credit for participating in this class. It's not that hard. As I switch slides, you guys follow along with me. So if you're here, you're starting a journey that's going to allow you to learn one of the most powerful skills out there today. You are definitely in the right place. How many of you have never written a line of computer code before in your entire life? Awesome. How many of you feel like you're still a beginner? Okay, great. Those of you that haven't written a line of computer code, that's going to change in about five minutes. Okay? So what are computers good at? So why are we so interested in figuring out how to use these powerful tools? These are things we're going to come back to because fundamentally, Computers are incredibly simple. And that's something I want you to remember and come back to over and over again this semester as you get frustrated with how simple they don't seem to be. So what are computers good at? Computers can do math. Computers can add and subtract and multiply numbers together. Computers can make simple, very simple decisions. One of the things that makes computers so powerful is they can repeat these types of steps over and over extremely rapidly. Extremely rapidly. The power of today's computers is really mind-boggling. It has become a little bit cliche to say it, 
but the smartphone that you guys have in your pocket is more powerful than the supercomputers that people were using even 20 years ago. And there are rooms, you can find pictures of them online, rooms full of powerful machines in data centers all over the world. We have reached a point in computing history where we have way more computing power than we know what to do with. What's missing are the people in this room. We need more computing people. We need more people like you with problems to solve that can harness these incredible capabilities. Computers can also store information. Unlike you, they have an extremely good memory. And they can communicate with us and with each other through screens, through messages sent over a global internet that now reaches an enormous percentage of the world's population, and, and in other ways. So let's try some of these examples. So these examples that we do in class, you can run in your browser. You can edit these. So here's an example of computers doing some basic math. If you haven't seen computer code before, don't be too scared. You're going to see a lot of it this semester. So this is the first little bit. Uh, what is this example doing? I'm initializing two variables. Then I'm printing their sum. Then I'm creating a third variable called z that I'm assigning to their sum plus one, and then I'm printing that third variable. And you'll see here, if I set this to something else, I get different results. So that's one of the things that computers can do. Computers can make simple decisions. And a lot of the basis for how you interact with computers is based on this type of extremely simple decision making. What's the temperature outside right now? Anyone want to guess? I came here in a different shirt. I'll just admit that. That shirt is like soaking wet in my bag. Uh, so it's warm out. What is it? Someone said 75? That doesn't feel like 75 to me. I, I, how about this? Why don't we say the temperature according to Jeff? Um, all right? So it feels like 85 out there to me. Maybe that's going to be the high today. And you'll see that I set a variable called temperature to 85, and that causes the computer to go make the decision to print out a particular thing to the display. So because that value is between 80 and, in this case, 95, I'm going to print out it's hot. If I change that to 100, then it's really hot. So the second thing that computers are good at, simple decision making. Computers can rapidly repeat these types of calculations. Here's an example. This is a silly example. But I have a loop here. And this loop is going to execute. I'm going to have to count the zeros here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So 10 million times. Every time it executes, what it's doing is it's updating the value of variable called i. And then when I'm done, it's going to print finish. See what just happened? Did you see it run? Watch carefully. It just ran. Did you see it run? Just ran. That did 10 million computations. And I want to point out most of the latency, which you can't even see here, is the result of sending this computation to one of our servers on campus where it's actually run in between. So you can see, yeah, that's, that's a computer doing 10 million things. You can't even tell. And finally, computers can communicate. So the examples we've been using have been using a Java primitive that we're going to see over and over again called system.out.println. This is a way of printing a message to the console, to the systems out console. In this case, I'm going to print hello world. You can edit this example to print hello CS125. And in fact, that's going to be your first homework assignment that we're going to assign today. OK. So one of the things you'll notice is that many of these capabilities that computers have are complementary to our own capabilities. You guys aren't good at math. I just want to break that to you. Given that there's like 900 people in this room, there's probably one of those people that can like, you know, multiply huge numbers in their head. Is there anybody like that here? The odds are in my favor. OK, maybe people are being shy. Um, but computers can do that, right? You're, you're good at making simple decisions, but you don't always make them consistently. Whereas computers are perfect decision makers. They will always make a decision according to the rules that you have provided them. Sometimes those rules aren't correct, but they will still make the decisions right. 
repeating things over and over again extremely quickly. How many people here feel like sometimes in their life they have to do something that's tedious, repetitive, on a computer? How many people have to do that on a computer? Data entry or something like that. Like, oh, I have to take every value in this spreadsheet and like, you know, I don't know, figure out if it contains a particular word, and I'm doing that by hand. Once you learn how to program, you will become incapable of doing this sorts of tedious things with computers. Instead, what you'll do is you'll show the computer how to do it for you. And finally, you know, computers, maybe some of you are good at communicating. I mean, this is a computer science course, so I'm setting a low bar here. Um, <laughs> but computers can do this in, in ways that, that you would find difficult. So computers can do this across time and space. You know, I, w one, of, one of the moments, you know, this has happened to me a couple times in my life. I'm older than you are, and so I have seen some of the changes in technology take place. I was in Singapore a couple years ago. I was at a, a bar in Singapore out with a friend at night, and the bar had free Wi-Fi. So I was texting with my wife, who was at home, about 12-hour time difference. So she was waking up in Buffalo. I was at a bar in Singapore. At some point, she decided, well, let's, uh, let's video chat. So we're video chatting on free Wi-Fi in Singapore, and the quality was pretty good. You know, so that's, like, this kind of thing is new to us as a human society. And it's all brought about because of the types of things that you're going to learn this morning. So, so this stuff, I mean, our imaginations and our capacity to use these tools are still lagging way behind what computers can do. And that's why I'm so passionate about teaching a class like this to such a large group, because, like I said, we need more computer people. We have plenty of computer power. What we need are more computer people like you. So working together with computers, one of the things we're finding out as we teach computers to do more and more sophisticated things is we're finding out aspects of what it actually means to be human. I would say today, the distinctive features our humanity of our humanity are starting to be defined by the things that computers can't do well. So computers can play a lot of games well, right? Computers mastered chess a long time ago. And now, actually, one of the ways that they detect cheating in chess is that they compare a human with a computer. If the human mimics the computer too closely, they assume the human is cheating. Because computers are so much better at chess than humans are. Some of you probably uh, read recently that computers have started to learn to play Go. Did anyone read about this? So Go is an ancient game, extremely complex. And what's, what's cool about it is that the computers not only learned how to play Go, but started to play Go in ways that surprised and amazed human commentators. So people have been watching Go for a long time, would see AlphaGo make moves and be like, wow, I've never, I didn't know that that was possible. The computer is actually finding out new ways to play the game. Does anyone know a game that computers are not good at? Sudoku? Eh. Rock, paper, scissors. There we go. I don't know if that's a game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so poker has been the challenge. I, I, I used to, you know, I, I speak to a lot of undergraduates, and a lot of times you hear, oh, I'm going to build a poker bot, right? And then their poker bot goes online and loses like hundreds of dollars, you know, <laughs> or more. And then it's like, well, I gave up the poker bot idea. Um, computers are not good at poker yet. Why? What distinctive human feature does it require to be good at poker? Lines. Yes. Bluffing is what they call it in poker. So it's, uh, it's a euphemism. So will we train computers to do this? We probably will, right? But certainly things like driving, for example. So we've seen computers start to master this task. Why are computers going to be better at us than driving? Because they have way better reflexes than we do. They have to learn how to make the complex decisions involved in navigating streets and dealing with human drivers. But as far as reaction times, I mean, again, computers can do billions of calculations in the time that it takes you to look up from your phone right, when, when you're driving. Okay. This semester, we're going to be uh, teaching you two really different things. I remember taking this class a long time ago. I'm not going to tell you how many years. Um, and I've never forgotten something that the professor said to me that day. 
he said, this is one of the few classes in college that teaches a skill. And that is true. We teach you in this class how to program. Pretty much intro programming courses and language classes are really kind of, you know, I at least at a liberal arts college, maybe here there's classes on, you know, machinery and stuff like that. But, there's, but this is a practical ability. Regardless of whether you go on in computer science, if you learn to program, you will find uses for that skill. It is by far the modern superpower. Once you learn how to do it, there's really not much that you cannot do. However, we're also going to talk about the concepts and the deep concerns that underlie the programming that we're going to do. So finding good ways for computers to solve problems can make the difference between something being intractable and something being tractable. And a lot of the ways that we, the computers have become more powerful are not just because they become faster, because that is important, but also we've found better ways, we've found better algorithms, we've found better strategies for figuring out how to solve problems using computers. So we're gonna talk about that. And as we go, you're gonna do a lot of programming. And that's gonna start today. Um, programming, so, so the concepts, here are some of the things we'll talk about this semester. Algorithms. So to me, algorithms are the conceptual heart of computer science. We have these machines that are incredibly specific and incredibly capable. How do we teach them how to do things? And the way that we use computers to solve problems is not always the same way that we would solve them ourselves. Sometimes we need to learn to take advantage of some of the computer's unique capabilities when we design computer algorithms. So representation involves showing computers how the world works and how to manipulate data in the world. So for example, photos. The way that we see a photo is very different than how a computer sees a, a picture, but once we can represent the data to a computer in a meaningful way, then we can do all sorts of cool things. Then it enables all those Photoshop tricks that you've seen online, all those fun filters that are built into the iPhone now to make it look like you took a perfect selfie or whatever. Um, that's all brought about because we've showed computers how to represent visual data. And then once they do that, once we've done that, they can manipulate it and do cool stuff. We're gonna talk later in the semester about a powerful pro problem solving strategy called recursion. And recursion has deep mathematical roots. If you go on and take classes like 173 and 225, you're gonna find that learning recursion is going to be very useful. Because particularly when we're trying to prove that a particular algorithm works, it's frequently useful to break it down into small pieces and then reassemble those solutions together. So essentially with recursion, we figure out how to solve a really small instance of the problem, and then we figure out how to combine those solutions into a larger solution. And once we've done, we've, we've done that, with a small amount of code, we can actually solve fairly sophisticated problems. All right, so the craft of computer science, here's the types of programming skills that you're gonna learn. We're gonna show you how to use standard imperative programming techniques. There are many different ways to write computer code, and as you go on in your life as a programmer, you will learn many different strategies, many different styles. But we teach imperative programming partly because it's on some level the best match for what the computer is actually doing. Repeating things over and over again, running in loops and things like this, making simple decisions. Java, the language we're gonna use this semester, includes a powerful object system that we're gonna show you how to use and we're gonna motivate. So Java's objects provide us with a way to model information uh, in ways that allow us to write programs in more elegant and useful ways. You'll also be getting used to software development practices. So we're going to talk about style. We're gonna talk about how to design you know, when you work on an MP, you're gonna have to design a medium-sized piece of code, and so you'd be exposed to some of these challenges. So how many, how many people have, like, heard that programming is boring, or, like, maybe if you heard that, you're not in this room, so that, that makes sense. Um, personally, I feel like it's, I love programming. Like, it is one of the most fun things I do every day, and I do a lot of it. Um, it's, to me, it's like the ultimate brain workout. So you know, when scientists study the brain, they associate various types of capacities with your two different hemispheres. So I don't know how many of you know this, but up here, there's like two parts. There's like a right lobe and a left lobe. And the right lobe has certain 
qualities associated with it um, that are s somehow more associated with creativity, um, sort of nonlinear thinking, dreaming, these types of things go on in the right lobe. The left lobe is the analytical part of the brain. It's the problem solving part. It's the, you know, step by step sort of checklist part of the brain. When you learn to program well, both parts of your brain are continuously engaged. And the reason is that the left brain, let me finish talking about this. So the left brain has to satisfy the computer. The computer is your ultimate left brain challenge because computers are incredibly literal machines. If you make a tiny mistake in your program, it will not work. And the computer will say something completely unhelpful. So on one hand, the left brain is sitting there tr making, you know, trying to build something that's correct enough that the computer can actually understand how to run it. At the same time, the right brain is thinking about style, is thinking about beauty, is thinking about the people that are gonna read the code. Those, so the right brain is the, is the people part because coding is not just about writing something that a computer can run. It's also about building software that is used by other people. And you know, one of the things that I hope to impress on you this semester is that learning how to solve a problem is not a stopping point. What we want to build in this class are beautiful, elegant solutions that you can be proud of, things that you can share on GitHub, so when you get to the point where you're actively engaged in the software development community, um, you will be impressing people with the types of solutions that you put out. Not just something that works, right? That when you look at it, your eyes are vomiting a little bit. Um, something that, that's clean, that's elegant, that's expressive, concise, um, and yes, actually really beautiful. There is such a thing as beautiful code. I try to write it every day, I fail a lot. I certainly recognize it when I see it. All right, so, you know, and this field is responsible. So one of the fun things we get to do in this class is talk about cool stuff. Computer science is responsible for so much of the cool things in the world, so many of the cool things. I think the internet is by far the most transformative thing that's ever happened to the world. We've connected an enormous part of the world's population together in a way that no one could have ever foreseen. Um, we will talk about some of these topics later in the semester. And you will build some cool stuff at the end of the semester. So we're gonna take you from kind of zero today to building Android apps by December. And if you want proof, I will show you the project fair uh, creations from last year's class. You can find these on the website. Um, we had, I can't remember, like 150 or 170 different projects. Each group worked together in a pair and built an Android application. Some of them were actually really cool. Some of them were simple. Others were extremely impressive. So this is where we're gonna try to get you by the end of the semester. You can build an app. You can put it on the Play Store or the App Store, and now you have billions of people that could potentially be using something that you've created with the skills that you learn in this class. Okay, so my name's Jeff. I teach this class. I like to be called Jeff. I don't like to be called challenge. Really don't like to be called challenge. I don't like to be called professor or doctor. I like to be called Jeff. You can also call me Gua if you want to. That's an old nickname that I'm starting to try to revive because there are like four Jeffreys in the department. Um, I'm here because I wanted to teach this class. I just wanna make sure you understand that about me. This is not something that I'm doing because I drew a short straw at the faculty meeting. Um, it's not something I'm doing because somebody said, you must teach a bigger class. I asked to teach 925 students in full Inter Auditorium this fall because this is the thing I do that I think has the most impact on the world. From now until December, you have my undivided attention. You will see me frequently we're actually rolling out an app this semester that's gonna allow you to determine when I'm in office hours, when I'm in my office, um, so you can stalk me if you want to and come by and visit. Um, when you don't see me, I'm probably working on something for 125. So, you know, I spend, during the semester, I spend an enormous amount of time and energy on this class, and I do it because I enjoy it an enormous amount. And, you know, when, you know, there's a lot of people in this class, I will get to know some of you, but I'm always thinking about you as a group. 
I'm always thinking about how can we make this class better. The type of things that we work on this semester that me and the course developers and the TAs will be doing are all designed around trying to ensure that you learn how to program, you learn about computer science, you come out of this course excited, and you don't give up. That's one of the pitfalls of a class like this. It is hard. We're going to push you because it matters, because this is important stuff. But we're here you know, uh, to, to take care of you, me and the course staff, and all the things we're doing, we're really trying to do for your benefit. Um, this is a big class. You may have noticed this. There are people in the balcony who I keep looking at for some reason. It's easier to look at you up there. I'm ignoring the larger group down here. Um, so, you know, sometimes when I, I tell people, oh, I'm teaching, you know, 800, 900 students, I get this look, you know. Some of your parents may have given you that look when you said you were signing up for this class. Like, you know, you know, that, that's that, that class, it's a big class, you know, like how could it be good? To me, a big class like this has to be good. There are no excuses. There's not 10 of you that's like, oh, whatever, I showed up half an hour late, no one cares, right? Like, I, you know, throughout the semester, the size and the velocity of this class is a huge incentive for me and the course staff to do our best every day. And again, you know, I don't have enough time in my day and my week to do the things I need to do for this class and to even spend, you know, a, even like a small amount of time with all of you. And that I don't like. I have 100 course staff, so even getting to know them is a challenge. But I really firmly believe that a course like this can work at this size. And the way we do that is we do that through systems. I'm a computer scientist. I believe in scale. I believe in doing things in a big way. I mean, it's not like Facebook was like, oh, we have 500 users. That's pretty good. You know, let's just stop there, right? You know, why, why get anyone else to sign up, right? Um, you know, we want to figure out how to teach everybody to program and about computer science. And so that's my challenge this semester. But just so you know that to me, the size of this class is a plus. We will do our best to put out high quality materials, high quality systems. You know, all the stuff you guys are gonna use this semester is done in an awareness that it matters. Because if we put out something that's bad or isn't you know, at its full potential, there's a large number of you that we're letting down. And we think about that a lot. Okay. Let me do 20 minutes of course administrivia stuff. So one of the things, ways that we try to, you know, help you with this class is through the website. So we put a lot of time and energy in the website. There's an enormous amount of information up there. Um, I would encourage you to look at the syllabus. I'm not going to spend, you know, I guess down here on South Campus they have something called syllabus week. Um, this is syllabus slide, okay? And then we're done with the syllabus. Um, there is a quiz on it this week, so I do expect you to um, read it and internalize it. The quiz is like, you can submit every question as many times as you want, just relax. Um, but, you know, there's a detailed syllabus that breaks down the grading components of the class, breaks down our motivation, how to approach different components of the course. Um, so this is one thing we do to try to help you. We also have a course form. So all of you are, have accounts created for you already on the course form once you enroll in the class. If you have questions about things, that is the way to ask them. Uh, please, one of the things that does not work well with a course this size is emailing me. Um, because, you know, I, I did this calculation for the syllabus this year. If I spend five minutes answering one email from you per week, that's 75 hours for the entire class. Okay, and I would like to do, I, I can do better things with that time. Ask the question on the forum. We've got 100 course staff there that'll answer it. If needed, I will answer it. And when we do, everybody in the class will see the answer to the question. Um, and, you know, uh, frequently when you have a question, it's a common question other people are confused about. All right, so here are, you know, you met some of these people this morning, but, you know, as I pointed out, we have a large um, and very motivated course staff. Um, you're gonna be seeing the CAs in lab sections and also at office hours. So we put a big priority on office hours for this class. There's more information about that on the website. All right, here's the unfun slide. Um, there are, you know, we are gonna ask you to work hard in this course. And some of you are gonna work hard and you're gonna spend hours on the MP, you know, maybe days. And you're not gonna quite get a perfect score. You're gonna learn a huge amount along the way. And then there's a couple of you out there, unfortunately, 
who are going to take a shortcut. You, we, we will find you. Let's just put it that way. We take this very seriously. Last semester, we filed about 30 fair violations with the college. If you plagiarize on, an, on one of the MPs, we will, we will file a fair violation for you. So don't. It's not because I'm a mean person. It's because of those people in this class who are going to work hard, play fair, and are still not going to get a perfect score. I care about them enough that I'm going to try to maintain as much as possible the integrity of assignments for this class. All right, so again, there's a lot of information on the website. Let's talk about lecture. So during lecture, we're going to be working on programming examples together. That's why I want you to bring your laptop to class. Um, if you have a laptop, bring it with you. If you don't, we have a survey that we're sending out right now. Please indicate on the survey that you don't have a laptop, and we will contact you to make other arrangements. You need it because your participation score for lecture is determined based on your activity related to the slides during class. Okay? All right. So I start at 9, and I will not wrap up until 9.50 on the dot. Maybe the 10 a.m. instructor is going to be angry with me, right? Um, but look, like this stuff's important, and I want you to get your money's worth. So that does mean that at 9.50, we got to pack up and get out of here because there's another class that needs to come in here and start at 10. Um, right now, the ground floor is very packed. The balcony is a little bit more sparse. In the future, I would encourage you guys to kind of try to distribute yourselves as evenly as possible. That'll make it a little faster to get out of here. Um, I'll start playing music in here around 8.30. Um, I feel like it could be louder. Did you guys think it was loud enough? Okay, it was all right. We'll try louder next time. Um, I need loud music in the mornings to, to, to wake up. So, so just another note on Bollinger. I love being in here. A couple of notes. So come to class on time so that we can get seated again. I'm starting at 9. Bring your laptop and bring it fully charged. There are, as far as I know, no power outlets in this room. If anyone finds one, let me know. Um, but you know what? I mean, don't feel like this is a problem with Bollinger. Siebel 1404 doesn't have power outlets, and that was built like two years ago. Um, the examples we do in class are going to rely on the Wi-Fi to work properly. I think we're going to be fine. But if five of you are streaming a soccer match, then we might have a problem. Okay? So please don't do that. Right? If you want to watch the soccer match, watch it you know, in, you know, in your residence hall or whatever. Right? Um, you know, and, and also be conscious of, like, don't bring like five devices that are all downloading their latest updates to class with you. Bring your laptop, you know, put, silence your other devices, um, and, you know, please be conscious of not, you know, there are a bunch of access points in here, so again, I think we're going to be okay, uh, but something we'll have to keep an eye on throughout the semester. All right. So, the, one of the core ways you learn in this class is by doing. So, we have a set of machine problems or MPs that we're going to assign this semester, and, the, and, and I really firmly believe this. Anybody can learn to program. What you need to do is do it and continuously do it. So we're going to have MPs for you to work on this semester. We're also going to have, particularly for the first couple weeks, daily homework assignments. These are small. It's like one little piece of code. But I want you programming every single day. I would assign them on the weekends if I thought I could get away with it. Uh, but we won't. This is how you learn to program. That, that there's no secret to it. There's no trick to it. It's not that some of you can do it and others can't. Um, you just have to do it. All right. So we already did this, but how, how many people in this class would consider themselves a beginner program? Okay. So I want everyone to look around and the number of hands that are up. This is the most the majority of the class. This course is designed for beginners. But what I ask of you is you have to work hard and keep up. That's it. We're going to move rapidly because I only get 15 weeks with you and I'm trying to make the most of it. But beginners can and do succeed in this class. I wish I had our statistics page up. It's down for maintenance right now. But last semester, we looked at the performance of beginners related to the rest of the class, and it was indistinguishable. So as a beginner in this class, you can succeed. There are, you know, there were as many beginners that got A's as there were people with somewhat more experience. So it is possible. Don't think that if you're a beginner, this class isn't for you. You do have to keep up. If you're a beginner and like, you peace out for a month, um, then you're going to have a problem. But if you're a beginner, you stay on top of things, you will learn. 
How many people here are not beginners? How many people here would like to have a little bit of experience? Okay. So if you're, if, if you're in that group, I expect a lot out of you. First of all, I expect you to be supportive of the beginners around you. One of the things that scares people when they get in a class like this is they may sit down next to you and laugh, and they may think that you're a beginner too. And they may be like, why does this person know so much? I just started this class a week ago, and they're like way ahead of me, okay? Be kind, be helpful, be encouraging, be honest about your background. If you've been programming since you were five, don't act like it just started last week. It's not fair to the people around you. We're also going to be asking you in labs and in other times to actually help out. So if you finish the lab activity in 45 minutes, your TA may ask you to stick around and help out some of the other students. Right? Why are we doing this? It's not because we're trying to punish you. It's because it will allow you to learn. You think you know this stuff. Try explaining it to somebody else. That is hard. All right. And I want to emphasize this. If you're a beginner and you meet someone in the class who seems to know more than you, remember that they might because they've been doing this longer. What's the only solution? Keep practicing. It's the only way to catch up. If you just give up, then you'll never get there. So if you feel discouraged because someone is better at you, better than, at something than you, what are you going to do? It's like, oh, that, that guy's a really fast runner. I'm just going to stop running and get fast, you know, because then I'll catch up with it. No, you just have to keep doing it, right? They've had more practice. But you can also see where they're getting. You can see, wow, this person is impressive. They really seem to get this stuff. I will get there too. Look at that person and say, this is me in a year. This is me in six months with more practice. All right, advice about how to succeed in this class. Come to things. Come to lecture. Come to labs. Um, do your daily homework problems. For the next week, those pr we're going to give you more time to finish those problems, but once the registration is stabilized, those are literally going to be a daily problem. We'll post it you know, the night before. It'll be active at midnight. We'll have 24 hours to do it. These are not hard. They're just a small piece of code to write or edit or fix. The biggest correlation with success on our MPs, particularly for beginners, is starting early. Starting early and coming to office hours. Those are the things that you can do to succeed. And partly by starting early, that allows you to come to office hours and get enough support. Don't miss your quizzes. We have weekly quizzes in the CBTF every week this semester. We're also giving three midterms in the CBTF this semester. I can see people's brains starting to explode. Let me uh, point out there is no final exam for this class. There are three assessments during the semester. The last thing we will do together in December is the final project fair. So that'll be awesome. That'll be fun, exciting. You get to show off what you've learned, and then we're done. OK? I did that on purpose. I don't like big exams. OK, so what's going on this week? I'm going to be in my office. So I'll be out, actually, on the steps right after lecture. If you have questions, please come join me out there. Um, at some point, I'm going to walk back to my office. I will be there until 1230. This is actually on the course calendar. If you have questions, please come visit. My office is right off the stairs um, on the second floor. I used to be up on the fourth floor. I got tired of walking up and down, and nobody would come to visit me up there. Um, so now I'm on the second floor, so you have no excuse. I have a nice office. It smells good in there. You know, I've got a big Android plush toy that you can come beat on when you get frustrated. Um, but I'll be there today till 1230. Uh, then I have other you know, department stuff to do, and at some point I need to go home and get ready for tomorrow's lab. So we posted our first homework problem. It's really easy. It's something you just saw in lecture. So everybody should be able to do this. Um, but again, our goal is to have you programming every day from now until December. We are having quizzes and labs this week. I don't, we don't have weeks to wait. It's like, oh, are you starting labs this week? Yeah, we're starting labs this week. It's a week of class. We have labs tomorrow and Wednesday. Those labs will help you set up your environment so that you can start working on the MPs. They also introduce you know, your t yourself to your TA, start to get to know the other students. The quiz starts tomorrow. It's running in the CBTF. Many of you are freshmen. You may not have taken a CBTF quiz before. The process is fairly straightforward. You go online. They have a scheduling system. You sign up for a time. You show up at that time. You take the quiz, and you're done. 
this week's quiz is designed to be practice. Every question on it you can answer multiple times until you get it right, as many times as you want. Please notice that. I remember last semester, like, the average on this quiz was 99.4 or something like that. And there was one student who didn't seem to figure out that they could just keep answering every question until they got it right. So someone didn't get 100. Don't do that. You sh this is a quiz. The average grade on this quiz should be 100. All right? Wednesday, we're going to keep, you know, barging forward with, with Java materials. We're going to talk about programming concepts in, in lecture. At some point on Thursday, we'll have some of the core systems for this class online, our grading interface, our statistics interface. Um, we're a little bit behind on that, but that's stuff should come up with this week. Friday, hopefully, our plan is to release our first MP. And what else is going to happen on Friday? Following the plan, another small homework problem. All right, I've got five minutes. Questions? I can take a couple of these. Yeah. It's about the syllabus, yes. The, the quiz this week is about course policy. It's about the syllabus. It is not a content-based quiz. It's a policy-based quiz that does two things. First of all, it allows you to practice using the CBTF. Second, it makes sure that you've sort of read the syllabus, or at least answer the question until you get it right. Yeah. Oh, this is a pray to learn problem. Post on the forum, we'll fix it. Questions, yeah. What's that? Great question for the forum. Yeah, there was a question here. The CBTF, the computer-based testing facility. So the CBTF, I should have explained this, I'm sorry, for freshmen here. The CBTF is located in the basement of Granger. Um, it's a, it's a secure facility with computers in it, sort of like ETS or something like that. The way it works, you make a reservation online, you show up at that time. When you're in the CBTF, there's certain exams that you can now see on Prairie Learn. So you log in to our site, there'll be a, a quiz there for you to take, you finish the quiz, and then you leave. Yeah, questions? You can submit the homework as many times as you want. Yep. All right, let me uh, point out, simmer down, I've got three more minutes. How about some extra credit opportunities? Will that quiet the crowd? Yeah, so we have a survey out that I'd like you to take. The link is here, I'll also post it on the forum and send it out via email. That survey asks you some questions about your background, your preparation for the class, um, this is a really critical way that we gather data about students that take the class so that we can make the course better. We also launched, I, I'm, I'm scared to, to announce this to 900 people, but we did launch a new app for the class. The goal of this app is to allow you to monitor course staff that are in office hours. It also gives you access to my location at certain times. So if I'm in my office or I'm in office hours, you'll be able to see where I am. If you download and install it and try to use it and log in, you will get 1% extra credit. All right. So one final quick announcement. There is an honors section for this class. It's called CS196. It is a fantastic course. It's rigorous. It's fun. It's uh, run almost entirely by students. It's super cool. It is one credit, okay? It's a lot of work for one credit, but those who have taken it really enjoy it. The first meeting for CS196 is tomorrow, 7 p.m. in Siebel 1404. This will also be posted on the forum both today and tomorrow. If you're curious about this class, show up and you'll have a chance to ask questions. You cannot register for CS196 yet, as far as I know. We won't open that up until next week. All right. So, final announcements before we're done. There is a homework problem out today. I'll find a way to fix the link. Labs start tomorrow. Quizzes start tomorrow. Wednesday, we're going to talk about variables, talk about Java primitive types, and maybe get to some conditional and looping expressions in class. If you're not registered for the class this week, please feel free to attend any lab you want. Just go to a lab, 
You're not going to get participation points for the lab yet, but you won't miss out on the chance to set up your environment. We do not have office hours today. Office hours will start on Thursday. All right. First lecture of 196 is tomorrow at 7 p.m. in Siebel. Thank you for being here today. I hope you'll be back on Wednesday. <laughs>